Hello and welcome back to Into the Light. I'm Dennis Cummins, the pastor of Experience Church. We're so glad that you're here today. We've got a special program. It's a continuation talking about critical race theory, you know, social justice versus biblical justice. And uh, we have Mark Melosha with the Family Policy Institute. And uh, I tell you what, Mark, we so appreciate the work that you guys are doing to work with legislators and to keep people's eyes on the values of godliness uh, as they're bringing forth laws. And so we so appreciate you being back with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor. It's wonderful being here and, 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 and kind of feeding off your enthusiasm for proclaiming the word of Jesus Christ. Amen. Also, we've got Dr. Christian Overman, and uh, he is a professional educator. He has a master's degree in education as well as a doctorate in theology. And uh, he has, uh, I would say, specific expertise in talking about critical race theory, especially in the realm of education, which that's where it's being implemented. So thank you so much, Dr. Christian, for being on with us again. It's a pleasure. Um, let's just kind of kick off. We, we talked last segment of, of, you know, a high overview regarding CRT and, and some of the, the, the high sweeping over. Uh, arches of that, but let's let's talk about some of the things that you're going to talk about coming up this Tuesday, about some of the inceptions, the conception of CRT, the origins, and and what's behind it. Yeah, well, if you peel the onion, you'll find that the origins go back really to Karl Marx. Mm. Uh, there was a school of academic philosophy that developed in the 1920s in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, it became known as the Frankfurt School, and it was openly Marxist. The main financier of that school, his last name, believe it or not, was Weil. Wow. <laughs> W-E-I-L, pronounced Weil in German. Uh, and he said he wanted the school to become famous for its contributions to Marxism. They looked to others, however, to form their theology. <laughs> I call it theology. Their ideology. Yeah. Uh, they went beyond Marx to others like Freud and Weber and others to come up with a new mix here. Um, and it became uh, a mix that became called cultural Marxism. So they took the classic Marxism of the conflict between the owners and the workers, an economic uh, field of oppressor versus oppressed, and they applied that to other fields in the culture, such as race, and sex, mm -hmm. okay. And they began the Marxist thing where you have to work towards freeing or liberating the oppressed. And that sounds great. I mean, what Christian wouldn't be right. for that, okay? Mm -hmm. Until you define, find out how they define oppressed. Oppressed to their mentality means anybody that's on the, the non-dominant side of the culture. Mm -hmm. So if you have the dominant side being Christianity, the rule of law, the rule of law, yeah. uh, enlightenment project even, and uh, so-called Eurocentric ideas, mm -hmm. and that's seen as dominant, it by the very nature that it's dominant, it is therefore oppressive. Mm -hmm. It's oppressive to the norms of the uh, homosexuals and others to say that we want homosexuality to be normative. Yeah. Okay, so if you have a dominant idea that says, no, homosexuality is sin, okay, we're not going to buy that, then you have to do all you can to free the oppressors from the oppressed. And so in that sense, the gender and, and sex uh, revolution, the people who have been feeling oppressed by normal Christian stuff are rising up and saying, we're not going to let you oppress us any longer. But they're not just going out for equality of opinion of, amongst equal voices. That's not what they're after. They are after canceling the oppressors. Mm -hmm. And that's just something that Christians are really slow to get. Yeah. The funny thing about this ideology, it's not, uh, it's not implemented or, 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 or mandated uniformly. In Muslim countries, where they're the dominant culture, mm -hmm. they don't apply critical race theory there. Mm -hmm. We're in Seattle or San Francisco, where the gay or the radical liberal culture is dominant, the atheist neo-pagan culture is yep. dominant, they don't apply it there. Right. They only apply it against white 
countries and in Christians. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is the only group their standard of morality applies to. Yeah, that's so important. See, I, I work in the nation of Nepal, been working there for about 11 years now. And if you want to talk about systemic oppression and racism, um, I, I'm fighting it every day of the week in what we're doing there because we're rescuing the lowest caste here we have castes. You know, you're born into this caste. It, your name has solidified your future of what kind of job you can do. Uh, you can't intermarry because that would, you know, mess up their their social structure of control. Mm. And so Christianity, uh, they've outlawed it again because Christianity brings equality to people mm. rather than this caste system. And and I tell people that are that are talking about critical race theory here in America, I'm like, look, if you want to see ra systemic racism, mm -hmm. let's go to Nepal. Yeah. Let's fight it there. Yeah. And they define the critical race theorists define racism in terms of power and resources. In fact, if you push them on this, really racism goes beyond skin color. It you can be a white supremacist, but you can also be a, what I call melanin-rich yeah. uh, person of color, quote-unquote. If you think white, mm -hmm. you are a racist. And you are, a, in fact, I think Candace Owens has been called a white supremacist, yes. okay, even though she has a lot of melanin in her skin. Right. I think um, uh, the guy um, who ran for governor in California, Larry Elder, mm -hmm. he was called the, the black face of white supremacy. So if you think like a white European Christian, you are a racist because they couch racism in terms of power and yeah. resources. And if you have the power, no matter what color you are, you are a racist. Mm -hmm. So they've redefined racist in those terms, which makes it slippery to even talk with people about it. Because if you think that racism is mistreating people on the basis of their ethnic group, or you're giving the others privilege because of their ethnic group, that's the old definition of racism. Mm -hmm. And most Christians are still thinking in those terms. Right. They don't realize that the whole definition has been changed. And, and so if they're against racism, and most Christians will say, I'm against racism, but what they mean is they are against power being controlled by white people, mm -hmm. and their solution to that is equality of distribution. So they want to make sure that every person gets the same amount of stuff. So That's Marxism. E equal outcomes. Then. Equal outcomes. And th this, this cracks me up because, um, you know, your millennials, they're, they're big on equal outcomes. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. You know, uh, if, if this is the demographic of, of the, uh, the, the people in, in this area, well, then we need to allow that, that demographic to apply for <laughs> education here. Well, how about on the football team? Okay, exactly. so do they want 6% of the Seahawks to be Asian? Okay, is that what they're after? Linemen. Linemen. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it goes to extremes, you know. But that's what quotas are all about. Yeah. Or, the, or you the or the MBA, you know, only yeah. six percent of the MBA should be uh, African American males. There you go. Yeah, uh, okay. you know, there should be uh, more. Um, Hispanics and Asians on the, the, the MBA. This is mm -hmm. the this is the insanity of quotas. You know, in California right now, I just read recently that now they require that any major corporation that's publicly owned that's headquartered in California has to have at least one director that is a self-identified woman. That mm -hmm. means a man who is self-identified. You have to have at least one person, and then the law, I think, next year is going to go to a certain size. You have to have up to three. Okay, so merit is. You know, okay, who, I don't care how you play basketball. Okay, if you got a certain skin color, you got to be here. You right. know, that's how insane it Skill, is. Skill, talent, uh, education, background, what they bring to the table is irrelevant. irrelevant. Why? I, I'll, I'll tell you what I think is behind this, and maybe you can speak to this, but it's really not about, you know, so many men, so many women, you know, uh, being a part of a, a corporation or a school. It's really the bottom line is to force churches to adopt employees or bring employees in that are contrary to the doctrinal statements that are part of the LGBTQ community. Because then when they cross that line and they legalize that, they have now eviscerated or exterminated the church as we know it in America. Yeah. And now we got to go underground. And they can even do it before then by withholding tax uh, credit for people for making donations to any non-profit organization yep. that does not buy into the narrative. They can do that very quickly. And, you know, if people aren't going to get tax 
credit for their donations, you might see a decrease. Now, in yeah. your church, no, you'll see it, you'll, it'll stay the same. But in many churches, you it'll will. affect them. It'll affect them greatly, and they'll put and them so out of business. The the end game is get rid of the church. They get yeah, rid of the church it, exactly. It's the only thing standing in the way of the antichrist agenda. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I think that uh, most believers are asleep at the wheel in that issue. They don't think it can happen here, Mm -hmm. and it can. It's happening as we speak. You're seeing it in the political realm as well. Just the Equality Act, I mean, that was a direct assault on every church in America. Absolutely. I can guarantee you that the tax exemption church, nonprofit tax exemption will be taken away in this country. Um, If if the Democratic Party, and and I'll be a little bit partisan, if the Democratic Party gets into power... That is going to be taken away from every church in America. And, um, and they'll keep bringing lawsuits to friendly judges, and they want to really overturn the First Amendment. Mm-hmm. That's where they're going. We all know that. So might as well start gearing up and, and trying to bring people back to Christ. That is the only solution for the churches in America. Mm-hmm. And a democracy, it's whoever has the most votes win. So if we can't keep the other side evangelizing our children, um, you know, stealing sheep from the flock, so to speak, from the shepherds, but we have to go back and bring people to Christ. That is the only way we're going to win here in America. So we see the inception starting, you know, decades ago or over, oh, yeah. you know, 100 years ago. In the ago. 1920s and 30s. And, oh, and okay, so back to them, Frankfurt School. So uh, and, and the 1930s was not a good time to be a Jew in yeah. Germany, most of these intellectuals were uh, ethnic Jews. I, I don't think they were Orthodox Jews, but mm-hmm. they weren't safe. Also, Hitler didn't like intellectuals either, so double whammy. <laughs> so they came to the United States of America, of yeah. all places, landed in New York City, Columbia. Set, up, set up their school at Columbia. Okay. Now, after the war, a lot of them went back to Germany, but a lot of them stayed, and they took up positions in different universities, including all the way the University of San Diego, uh, California and San Diego, Marcusa who was one of the original Frankfurt School guys. He's the father of the 1960s sexual revolution. He wrote this book called Eros and Civilization, which became the Bible of 1960s, mm. Make Love, Not War, Sexual Revolution. That revolution is still going on because the fight to liberate themselves from the oppressors, yeah. i.e. the Christian people who, who don't approve, is still going on. Okay, and... Uh, Anyway, so the sexual revolution is not over, but it really got off the ground from a Frankfurt School guru, Mm -hmm. uh, Herbert Marcuse. And so we talk about that, and then we talk about, you know, how it went into the... You see, critical race theory is a subset of a larger umbrella theory called critical theory, Mm -hmm. okay? And out of that came critical race theory, critical uh, gender studies, critical gender theory, by the way. And you have critical pedagogy, which was strong down in Brazil, and you have critical legal theory. Out of critical legal theory came critical race theory, much work done at Harvard through a particular professor there who um, called it his own, and he developed it. He's now gone, but others took it on. So it has a long history. Uh, and I would say, if you say that it's Marxist, I would be careful to say this. Well, well, it's a form of Marxism that is, is third or fourth generation. It's Marxism 3.0, Marxism 4.0. Yeah. So people who object, oh, no, we're not Marxist. Well, you're, you're an aberration of Marxism that has its roots in the oppressor-oppressed ideology, which is the foundation of the whole thing, which leads to more racism than it solves because it absolutely puts huge blocks of people into certain camps as oppressor based largely on their skin color. Mm -hmm. And it's causing people to see white people in a racist way like never before. And it's getting not good. And I, I, this is a theory, I don't know, can't prove it, but I have a feeling that that guy that drove that SUV through the crowd of Christmas Christmas parade, mostly white people, mm-hmm. uh, may have swallowed the pill. Mm-hmm. You know, because if you believe that you're oppressed by white people, okay, yeah, some people they're are going to get mad, yeah, and they're going to fight back. Absolutely. Now they're not all going to drive SUVs into crowds, thank right. God. But yeah. some of them can yeah. do that, yeah. okay, if they if they let their mind go. Also. Uh, uh, this explains why now there's uh, uh, gang looting going on. Because if you really feel that 
the white people are in power and they're rich because they built their empires off the backs of slaves mm -hmm. and uh, oppressed people, then if you are oppressed, and if you're in that category is oppressed because of your skin color, you have a right to get back what was stolen. Yeah. You know, so you may as well go to the store, yeah. get it all out, take it all out of the store because you have a right to it anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not really stealing because they stole it from you in the first place. Right. That's how the mind works, you know. So the ramifications of critical race theory, going back to critical theory, oppressed presser, whether critical sex theory, critical gender theory, it's all the same idea, has huge ramifications for culture and for everyday living. In including your business, yeah. and it can go down the tube quickly, Absolutely. because people want it to go down the tube. Because you know you deserve to be gotten back at. <laughs> right, right. Well, you look at the mobbery and and the looting and the burning and all that. And of course, we had the tools and we had the manpower to nip it in the bud to stop it. Yeah. But it's because those that are in charge of the manpower, yeah, bought into it, or agreed, or was behind it. Yeah. And so there's something greater at work than what most people are seeing. And to be honest with you, a lot of people think I'm, I'm, you're, it's going to shock you. Oh, really? There are people that think that I'm very political <laughs> oh. as a pastor. Really? And uh, I, I just tell them, we're not the Patriot Church. We're a biblical church that believes in biblical values. And we need to be the heart that pumps the values as, into the arteries of our community. Yeah. That's and, loving your neighbor. And if that looks political to you, then so be it. Yeah. I, I can't help that. But I'm not going to apologize for truth because they're trying to dismantle everything that... There's no America standing behind in the wings to help America. Yeah. If we go, who's left? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe... Maybe Hungary might be the place to go, or Poland. <laughs> the Nordic. <laughs> I don't think they'll let us in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If we go, yeah. I, uh, yeah. So, from your standpoint, we have, we, we've got to vote in the right policies. But yet, there's a domino effect. People can't vote the right policies unless they have the right values. In, yes. Pier in Pierce County, the, the last election that we just had, we had only 18% turnout for the vote. With everything that's going on, only 18%. 18% of all the possible voters, yep. you mean? No matter what their persuasion? Yep. yep. Blows the mind. In yeah. an off-year election, that, that is what happens. And that's how sometimes a passionate minority, and our opponents who here were for many years a passionate minority, became yeah. in power. Yeah. Uh, it's up for Christians to become passionate be educated on the issues, then go out and vote. And too many Christians are sitting at home. Yeah. And part of the reason is, is many pastors, their, their shepherd, their leader is not encouraging them to vote and to minister and talk to their elected officials, get them to do the right thing, get them to do what God calls them, calls all of us to do. Yeah. yeah. And this is why, you know, if you're watching right now, uh, I, I challenge you that if you're not hearing biblical values coming to challenge you to vote the Word of God, you need to challenge your leadership, your church leadership. You have every Excellent. right to hold your leaders to, the, to the, the values of the Word of God. You know, for us, I'm not, I might be the chairman or, and the pastor of, of this church, but I'm not the ultimate authority. Here, the Word of God is the ultimate authority. Mm -hmm. So everybody has a right to hold me to the values of the Word of God. Yes. And I think that's every believer. We have every right to hold our pastors and our eldership or board, whatever the government is, to the standards of the Word of God. And if they will not uphold that, then you are released and you need to find a place that you can be fed and challenged to do the work of God. And and know what's going on. You know, what our organization does, we grade the elected officials. This is huge, guys. There are eight critical race theories bills passed um, in March of this year, earlier this year. Yeah. Um, and now you know who voted for those critical race theories, and now you know who to vote against. How do That's, people get that? Oh, go to fpiwaction.org, and you will see this. And join our uh, newsletter uh, we will keep you informed so you know which ledgers, uh, who your ledgers are, then you know to call up and advocate and tell them that you're disappointed in their critical race theory votes. You would like them to vote differently next year. And if they don't, well, that's when you start looking for a new person to fill that seat. Absolutely. 
this this is huge. Um, and the resources that the Family Policy Institute has that can keep you informed, keep you educated, uh, is is so invaluable to we, you as a believer. We put together each year, in fact, it'll be released uh, next week, a Christian policy agenda for all of Washington State on all the issues of life and marriage and family, especially religious freedom, which is very important now, yeah. and also parental rights. There's a movement in our country right now to take parents out of the equation. Yep. The children are considered wards of the state. Can't trust parents. That was a whole result going on in Virginia mm -hmm. where the Governor McAuliffe out there made the uh, silly statement that parents shouldn't decide what their child is taught in the public schools. Yeah. Parents are responsible for the education and values of their children. Mm -hmm. And now you see this radical critical race theory, Marxist ideology that says the state knows best mm -hmm. and we want to take parents out from being parents. So those are the issues we deal with and also Christian justice, not this radical Marxist justice that they're trying to implement. Absolutely. So, you know, with this next election, uh, I know some people like, well, let's go for a moderate because they have a chance. Let's find somebody that's moderate. Um, to be honest with you, it's going to take somebody with some stones, some ability and some moxie to be able to fight the onslaught of what's going on. And so I don't think we need moderate candidates. We need candidates with conviction that we can get behind and support. And um, if, if we as churches and pastors don't step up, we will lose the state. You know, you'd mentioned earlier many of your examples uh, mm -hmm. that you're going to be sharing. Some yeah. of those... Almost are, all of them are from Washington. So this is kind of the tip of the spear is what you're seeing? Well, I wanted to take examples from Washington because that's where we live. Okay. And I didn't want people to think I was, you know, I'm cherry picking the worst of the worst all across the country. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to go far to find out what's <laughs> really going on. Yeah. And hopefully it'd be a wake up call to local people. And it's through uh, this organization, which focuses in on policy in Washington I, state. So I literally got a, a question from a former pastor, uh, email last night saying it's not happening here in Washington State. I told him, well, go have, to have our event. Tune, tune exactly. On, on, That's, on that was See, Mark I, Pike. I'm actually going to play videotape of a session of equity training that was done in the North Kitsap public school district, North Kitsap, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's a rural area. And I, I, I'd be a little facetious here, but you really gotta watch out for them because that's where Paul's bow is. And that's the little Norway and they must be very European there. So watch out for them. I'm being a little tongue in cheek there, but it's not just in downtown Seattle yeah. that, that it's an issue. It exactly. is throughout. So yeah, I yeah. have him tune in on Tuesday night, seven o'clock. How do they sign up for it? Go to fpiw.org and uh, sign up, and you'll learn a lot. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, and, and again, there's many buzzwords because uh, the, the school boards have said, oh, no, we are not teaching critical race theory. And they can say that with a straight face because yeah. it has so many other labels and it has so many other ways for them yep. to feed the pills to the children, right? Yeah, social, economic learning, diversity training, equity training, they all sound good. I mean, who wouldn't want that? And to be honest with you, a lot of what they teach is good stuff. I mean, there's the problem here is you got to watch out for the problem pills, which are coated with sugar, yes. okay? And the, and the thrust of it all is very, very uh, different than what you would think it is from the title. And so we'll talk about that on Tuesday night, too. Good, yeah. good, good, good. Well, I tell you, this hopefully is empowering you to be better equipped. And uh, I'm going to be sharing this uh, Sunday. So, um, you know, we, we have to address these things. We have to equip our people on how to step up into these conversations rather than stay quiet and avoid the topics. And um, so I appreciate you guys coming. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Appreciate you. And uh, we just believe that we're going to affect people and we're going to impact and open eyes today. And bring yeah. them back to Christ. Amen. That's the key. Amen. That's how you change a voter. Yes. We need a great awakening. That's how you change a voter. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. Follow us uh, on iTunes, Spotify, uh, all of those social media platforms. We're out there, experiencechurch.tv. May God bless you and stay strong. <laughs>